You're listening to Parasearch Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or their affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Haunted Histories with your host, Penny G. Morgan, right here on Parasearch UK Radio. Evening all. How are we? Can someone tell me where the nice weather's gone? Because it's like we've gone from summer to autumn, just like that. Just like that. I don't like it don't like it i want the sun back i want i want the warmth back um and it's still one of those it's still that sort of weather where you have to go out in the morning wearing a jumper but god forbid you put the jumper on so after about three o'clock because then you'll just melt or is that just me i don't i don't think it's me having hot flushes i i, I think it ah oh, i want i want my summer back where's it gone anyway i'm just whinging i'm sorry uh, I'm sure I'm not the only person who feels like that and anyone listening who's in other countries where it's still amazingly warm, like I keep seeing it is in places like Texas, you're probably going oh, I don't know what your problem is Penny, it's lovely here but anyway, give us a ticket and I'll come and visit <laughs> anyway anyway, so what have you all been up to? Hi Rich nice to see you there what have you all been up to? well I, I was lucky enough to go and go to one of my favourite places last weekend, the weekend just got um, even better, it's only 15 miles up the road from my mum and dad so I don't even have to drive back to Essex afterwards but I was out with the awesome guys, a shout out to those guys from Simply Ghost Nights ably led by Rosie and we love Stuart Dawson, it was Gresson Hall Workhouse and it was a bit of an interesting evening it was a very interesting evening I'm not going to talk too much about it because uh, book three is going to be on workhouses and I might have to um, put some of the uh, information into that but it was a very interesting and it was the most active I've ever seen the workhouse as well and it just goes to show all the groups we had all the public groups we had were so up for it and so positive and so they were all genuinely up for it and I really think that energy made a difference it was brilliant brilliant night and I get to wander around a workhouse at night without people who don't really want to be there. Oh, it's one of my favourite Canadians in the house, Mr. Goldman. Hi, Wes. You all right, my darling? And what else? Oh, and this weekend I'm actually off out again. My, my husband's forgotten what I look like. I'm actually off to the hitching school with those mad birds from the Paranormal Sisters. I think there might still be tickets left if you go onto their pages and check but yeah I'm going to be doing the hitching school which is another one that's been on my wish list for a very very long time but on that note I'm going to be interviewing someone now who has also been on my wish list for a very long time but and I'm waiting for her to cackle in the background as I start saying this but you know you kind of have to get your strength up to interview this girl because she knows a lot and hi SJ she knows a lot and she's fascinating to talk to but I've been joking all along that I need danger money to conduct this interview and I think I probably do because I've got to kind of keep this interview for an hour and keep it on track and anyone who knows me and my guests will know that a we can't talk just for an hour in fact we've already talked earlier today um and we don't tend to stay on track very long at all hi Hazel yeah we don't stay on track very long at all it's the one and only and i I probably don't even need to say a a name i just need to introduce her and say special guest can you say hello for us hello does nobody recognize (laughs) her yet if you're not it's the wonderful karim basant or besant however you pronounce it do you want a basant or besant these days um, the family a hundred years ago tried to be posh and say Bizant, but as you can tell by my action, uh, my accent were rough like. <laughs> <laughs> so you're peasant as in peasant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it 
is oh. Karim Bas- I'll call you Basant because I quite like pronouncing it like that because you've got a posh first name your, your surname ain't Karen is it it's Karin so oh, Karim yeah. Basant so you can go posh because everyone tells me I've got a posh voice so I have to pronounce you posh oh thank you darling you're very welcome <laughs> how you doing anyway Chicky? oh after being ill I'm absolutely on top of the world again thank god well no it's because you're talking to me that's why you're happy oh bless you it's what? history we love it well when when we booked the interview and you went yeah yeah I'll do it I'll do it I'll do it when do you want to do it and I'm like, Just calm down love I've booked you in we'll get there <laughs> oh yeah we, we've got to remember these forgotten gems they're I dotted agree. all around the country I agree and what I love about your history knowledge KB is you really do look at forgotten gems you look at ones that aren't general knowledge like even the situations surrounding them are quite I wouldn't say local but quite um, the, the, you don't see much written about them in the general sort of um, well the market if you know what I mean you don't it's it's very sort of specialist I'm trying to think of a way of putting it um, but it's not like sort of I mean my, my general history knowledge is, is pretty good has to be doing this show every single week you pick up so much um but the stuff you and i were talking about today i genuinely a lot of it i didn't know until i'd looked it up which is which is what i i love about your specialist you're very specialist in your knowledge but in a good way (laughs) you're not just special you are special but It's the laugh, isn't it? God, oh God, we've got to try and keep this serious, ish. Yeah, but your <laughs> your knowledge is very specialist. You don't you don't go for the, the the general sort of what everyone will know about. You like to go on the kind of oddball route of things to ex- sort of teach people. Would well, you, it's, would it's you agree exactly. with that? Yeah, but also living in Bristol, you think you know your own city, mm. but the last few years. You, you. I mean, it must have been about six years ago. I actually drove past by accident, past the brasswork site, and I was like, well, "What's this then? Museum, mm. clock tower?" I knew nothing about it because Bristol has a way of hiding its forgotten gems, mm. and that's what it does so well. And you know, locals and people past the city know nothing about it. Mm. And historically, you know, this brasswork site is of national importance. It was one of the major um, turning points in the Industrial Revolution with with the creator, William Champion, what he did with the zinc smelting and the brasswork. You know, he was the first he was the first to integrate um, production of copper, brass and zinc, wasn't he? Exactly. He, he, was um, a, he was a revolutionary, I can never say this, metallurg- metallurgist. 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 <laughs> oh, metal person. <laughs> but you're right, you're right. When you, Your own town, because you, you think you know it. But it's it's like, I remember once when I used, to, I used to live in Norwich. And one day, I can't remember why I wasn't at work that day, but I thought, I just thought to myself... I am going to be a tourist for the day. I'm going to look at Norwich with tourist eyes. Mm. And I discovered things. I'd lived there for 20 years. I didn't know were there. Like little side alleys that you suddenly think, well, what was down here? This is a bit strange. And, and and museums that, I didn't know that was here. I never knew that was here. Or And as you say, buildings, and you start asking, well, what was it? I mean, when, when we, you know, I mean, one of my passions we all know is the workhouses. I could mm. normally spot a workhouse from a mile away. That, that and I can normally sort of say I think that might have been a workhouse, look it up and 90% of the time I'm right but it's that kind of intriguing thing when you do see a building and it's a bit derelict or only basic you know, basic use and you think what was that built for? What was yes. that built for? And and that's basically what you're saying about Warmly, Clock Tower, that's one of the first things you thought when you saw it like what was it? Yes I I knew straight away by the architecture there was something interesting Mm. and then you go home and then you 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 visit and then for two years we were very lucky um my team Cypress of Paranormal to investigate it secretly Mm -hmm. Uh, but then you like with lots of places you you fall in love with them and you realize that 
this place, like lots of other well-deserving um, historical locations, need a venue. Need uh, sorry, need money. And what you know, too many is happening with the prisons now are being turned into plush apartments where mm-hmm. really you know, they should be saved for future generations. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we've got we've got so much paranormal royalty in the chat room tonight. Kelly Ellis is also there, and uh, and 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 I must admit, Kelly, I'm a bit offended you've said this, but she's put Corinne is so knowledgeable. <laughs> Obviously, oh, I'm yeah. not. I'm not. Oh. Obviously. Um, <laughs> she listened to me, but poor thing. I think she's on Valium now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it looks like I've got a glass of orange squash in front of me, um, but you know, really, it's just orange coloured vodka. Neat, yeah. you know, because I'm just <laughs> sipping on that as I'm talking. Um, yes, Kat, Corinne is very knowledgeable. This is why I enjoy talking to her. Although we did have this conversation earlier today, and she turned around and said to me that um, I was more academic than her which i found yeah. very very think, funny no i, I personally I, I think you are um you you come across as someone who has studied a specialist subject for many years and you're very articulate and knowledgeable and you have a fantastic way of explaining a subject that to me especially is very interesting oh thank you no not studied it self-taught um, but like we were talking about sort of before before we went on air we'll, we'll sort of talk about some of Corinne's things she's got coming up at the end of the interview but um, I've done a lot of sort of presenting and training in my time so it's probably why I can and it's a genuine passion but um, yeah so I do agree with you Kelly she is very knowledgeable and this is part of the reason why whenever we have a conversation it tends to go on for about four hours because we go from tangent to tangent literally <laughs> don't we we'll, we'll talk about one thing which leads us into another thing i think we nearly did it today when we were talking about we'll, we'll get on to uh, william champion in a second but we were mm. talking i think we were talking about quakerism once and that led us on to a different thing and then led us yeah. on to a different thing and three hours down the line we're like shit <laughs> we've been talking for three hours um but you know it, it was an interesting I, I, I remember the conversation it, it was earlier this year wasn't it and it was a very interesting conversation and uh, could have gone on for a lot longer I reckon um, but the thing is about Warmly anyone looking at the pictures that we we put up on the, the, the page it, it, it does just look like a tiny a reasonably small sort of industrial sized building with a clock tower and when you first suggested it to me I didn't I'll be honest when you first suggested it earlier this year to do a show on it and I thought yep yeah, okay I trust Corinne she knows her history if she says it's an interesting place I trust her and I only really started researching it the last few days because the, I have to do different places every week as you can imagine if I don't research them in order I get I'm, I'm, I'm getting old and I'm blonde I get a bit confused <laughs> <laughs> I start mixing my places up I was astounded when I found out what it actually was because when you said to me I want to talk about warmly clock tower I was thinking a clock? What's going to be bloody interesting about a clock well it is a huge site and the clock tower as we were saying earlier is a very small part of it mm. um, but there is under separate trustees and we're hoping um, with help of the Gloucester Council that eventually it will go under what's called the Brassworks site umbrella uh-huh. um, and then for paranormal investigators there will be three locations within two minutes walking to investigate that is the long-term plan hopefully mm-hmm. yeah um, you know and the clock tower itself it's the heart it's what i call the heart of the brasswork site because mm-hmm. it's in the middle of this fantastic location just to walk around it in the mm-hmm. summer you know oh there's so much to talk about. Where should we start? Well, firstly, do you know what would they have used the clock tower for? Would would it have been um, used to? Would it have had some kind of bell system so people knew when to come to work and all of that kind of thing? Do we know? The only thing I can find out so far that um, it seemed to be an integral part. Now, um, 
the museum just around the corner mm-hmm. it had the melting so- uh, tower it also has the ice house mm-hmm. or the big house of William Champions called Warmly House which mm-hmm. is now a residential home mm. and um, then you know being at the time a rich man he decided then to build a huge lake mm. and there is a huge tower I think it's about 10 metres tall of Neptune he's, he's lost his trident and another arm but it's I think it's the tallest garden statue in the UK alright uh, so there's very, there's lots of beautiful paintings and you can see how wonderful and there was a boathouse which is privately owned now mm-hmm. and then next to the Warmley house as was very fashionable in the um, late 1700s, he built a grotto based on a famous one in Italy, which I can't think the name of. And that had um, beautiful cascading waterfalls going all the way through it. And if you go on Paranormal Venue Advisor, there are pictures of the grotto on there. I, I did a little bit about it. And it has if you stand in the right place you can see a face with a huge mouth and it was built with clinker and mortar this is all byproducts from a smelting work like um what we call black slag mm-hmm. um there's a famous pub just outside bristol called uh, the black castle and it was built from this stone that used oh, right. to be stained. but these were all quakers yeah, Bristol was full of these amazing Quaker. It and was, wasn't it? The whole, that whole. Air, the, I mean, I remember when yeah, I came to visit Bristol, yes. and I think you and I talked about it. I said about that big orphanage that was built by yeah. a famous Quaker. Why was well, Quakerism so popular in Bristol? I, like you say, you know, by the time sort of late mid seventeen hundreds, they weren't as pure as. Post, can't talk tonight persecuted like they used to yeah. be because you know, John Wesley came down mm. he was part and parcel of bringing to religion into this wild west of what we call the Kingswood Forest area which included Warmly Kingswood um, and you know we'll, we'll go on to talk about the Cot Road Gang and, and everything and you know the famous case of John Horwood but it was no one would venture there on their own so you've got John Wesley he comes he preaches on a hill just outside Bristol Mm -hmm. next thing he has this beautiful uh, meeting room in the centre of Bristol which you can still see today Mm -hmm. it is fantastic and of course Methodism became a huge integral part of um, a lot of um, common folk especially you know around Bristol baptism all that sort of thing um and w- surrounding bristol you had tons and tons of uh, coal pits you know not far from where i live warmly that was the majority of the job and you reminded me about how many people at one point were working on um champions smelting works yeah I'll, I'll mention that fact in a sec hazel has just put that hazel ford has just put john cabry was a quaker and look at the fantastic work he did <laughs> oh yes but also people forget these quakers were one of the first to treat their workers fairly look at bourneville yeah, yeah. yep and a lot, of the, a lot of the quakers i mean there was uh, when i was reading up on the notes um for this and I think part of it was that that guide that I sent through to you that I'd found online that pdf I sent you there was another Quaker who'd built um a factory of I can't remember what they said the factory was um and he did actually so and this is in the mid 1700s so way before the industrial revolution and way before the industrialists who were building cotton mills were building entire you know self-contained villages for their staff he he was built he had a school he had um a social club um he built the houses because he felt that he, you know if he took care of his staff they would work hard for him and and giving them a purpose and giving them a life and and you're saying about the the well i found that in in it, well william champion took a, he built that um warmly 
well, we'll call it what the Warmly Works, which is, I think, what it was called, 1743, mm-hmm. didn't he? But uh, but twenty six later years later, he went bankrupt. Yeah, but he was in the centre of Bristol. Now, the centre of Bristol, um, old medieval town, pollution awful. Mm. Apparently, his pollution was so bad. He got thrown out of Pris- uh, of Bristol, and his father-in-law bought the land it warmly for him to build his new factory, which I mm. think is hysterical. It is quite because, funny. Because you had rancid rivers going through the centre of Bristol, and you had cholera. You know, it, it, it was awful, absolutely awful. Yeah. And for this man to be thrown out for pollution was quite ironic. Well, yeah, now it was queer as folk. Now it's queer as folk, okay. But he, he actually, at at the, the peak of it, he was employing over 800 people at that one plant works in Warmley. Now, we say one plant works. I, I, I mean, you'll probably be able to correct me if I'm wrong, Karen, but I, I read it was a 13 acres worth of site. Yeah. And yeah. it was it was quite ahead of its time in that it had um, a water... Excuse me, what's that? <coughs> a water-powered... Um, a water-powered engine system that worked and all this kind of revolutionary... Absolutely revolutionary stuff. Um, the mail, water... Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was all self-contained. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, he, he, he went bankrupt. But what he was actually making there which again I'd never given much thought to were pins he mm. was using the metalwork to make pins and make it, the making of pins wasn't just some of them were made in the factory uh, as we know but you had children um, between the ages of say 9 and 11 uh, and, I, and I was looking at a sheet that was giving a rough guide to how much they would have earned and to be fair the earnings for back then in the sort of 1750s wasn't that shock well it was it wasn't great but then again yeah. Um, it, it wasn't sort of the uh, cuff around the ears and um, lead poisoning or whatever, like you get in some factories. Um, but they also used to to have quite a big cot- uh, cottage industry for pin making, and so because it was actually meant to be quite skilled, wasn't it? The actual making yeah. of the pins. It was, um, a family affair, so you would have had the whole family involved. Mm. And you know, the, I only found this out as I said to you earlier. Uh, couple of months two months ago something like that that it was only there in gloucester that actually made these brass um dress making pins yeah so again it's that place is of such historical note that i'm very passionate and i know many others are of keeping it going yeah because if we we think how vital pins are any kind of pin um, and the other interesting fact I had that will appeal to my interest in the workhouse movement and the poor laws before the poor law amendment act of 1834 came in obviously a lot of the workout they, they still had the workhouse the poor house and they would actually because they just couldn't find enough because it tended to be women and children who did the actual pin making the men tended to do the metal work but the women because they had smaller fingers and a bit better sort of dexterity i suppose they made these little fine pins they couldn't find enough people to do it so they used to actually get pay the workhouse women to do it as well they would ship off batches to the local poorhouses to get them to do it and give them a job as well yeah there's no such thing as just sitting back on your backside in those days no cranky but it was a really you know, sort of really they, everyone was rewarded for the work mm-hmm. that they did but um, again, you know, having this Quaker um, employer who actually cared to a certain degree, you know, ahead of his time to look after his workforce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wes has asked about the working conditions. Were they very poor, would you have said? Well, I, I would have if, said not for the time. No, but then again, they wouldn't have known um, about the health risks as we know now, obviously. So accidents happened all the time, you know, especially if children involved, because children are small, they will be able to get under any machines or, mm. you know, retrieve some retrieve something that adults adult hands couldn't reach into. Um, so, yeah, you know, that, that would have happened. Um, same as 
chimney sweep children you know how mm. many children got stuck up tr- chimneys mm. well you look yeah. at the industrial revolution in the 1800s how many children got killed crawling under the um the weaving machines to unblock them or put new cotton reels in and everything else but i i would have said the descriptions i've read of the that the, the way that they were treated in the factories for, for want of a better term in the works was actually no worse and it's probably i mean it's such a nice area as well so they would have had the fresh air they would have had exactly um the hours looking at the hours and stuff it was well before they had out, you know, regulations as to how long children could work and what age children could work and all of that. Basically, if you had no money, your children went out to work. That that, uh, that was, you know, what happened. You couldn't pay for education, so therefore your children went out to work and would work 12, 14, 15 hour days. Mm. Um, but they were... And you have to remember that having a king on the throne, um, George II and then later George the Fir, George III, the fashion was to have these huge families mm. and poor people poor people didn't have a choice no you know families of 10 completely common mm. obviously lucky if half of them survived yeah who adult was yeah um but you know that that's what they did in their days and we were talking earlier about women having to work and you know um dosing their babies to keep them quiet we were with mother's little helper Yes, yeah, mm. happened with my mum. Mm. Um, to you know, people on the field, so they, they had to get on and work. Women had to earn money. Well, actually, first tangent, I'm going to take us off on. Mother's little helper was actually what the child killer Amelia Dyer used with the babies mm. that she was farming. She got told to use it. Yes, children, everyone was expendable. Wes, everyone was expendable. Life wasn't really. Um, yeah basically you were so ready for, especially children I mean I can't remember what the mortality rate would have been back in the 1750s for children under the age of five but it must, have, it must have been about two or three and five would not make it if not more uh, looking right. at sort of records and things from back then but anyway so Amelia Dyer she was told by another nurse dose the children up with the, that mother's little helper that had the, the drug in that you mentioned when we were talking earlier uh, keeps them quiet, keeps them subdued, and it means they lose their appetite, so you don't need to feed them so much. So, yeah, it's. And it was called Mother's Little Helper. Um, but I so, found out the other week with this um, thing that I'm doing, there were two local Bristol women in the early 1800s that were both hung for um, infanticide. Mm-hmm. So, in one thing, you know, death children was common but if you willfully yes left child you would be hung for it yeah and sometimes these, these women just didn't understand you know because they had mental problems themselves yes. yeah yeah no i mean what, what i mean when i say anyone was expendable you know if you if something happened to you you you, you didn't get um you didn't get so he's just Wes has just said kind of like the guys in red uniforms on Star Trek um, <laughs> yeah the extra and always got killed off in this show <laughs> oh dear and then Richard's put I thought Valium was called Mother's Little Helper it, it was but this, this there was this medication they used to call Mother's Little Helper because it used to help mothers placate their children but I suppose <laughs> hey what can I say it's just it's just the way it is um, but <laughs> They were still using it in the 1920s. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. But getting getting back to... So I'm just trying to grab something here. Getting back to um, the pins. So we've got this massive industry that is only... You know, it's really... It's basically that part of the the world that it was really... um, concentrated in and and I was quite interested as to to why why was it do you, have you got any thoughts on that well you know my interest goes beyond just the you know the the clock factory clock tower and the brass size is but more the surrounding area as well because I believe that's all interlinked together mm-hmm. um, and you to so I'm very surprised that William a champion, his father-in-law, when he bought the land to build that factory, that 
there was no protection money paid out to some of the well-known families. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, because it was so lawless, that's that's how everything worked. Mm. So, um, when we talk about this this gang shortly, um, I was reading up earlier just to remind myself how many of them were hung, transported, and then one night, twenty five members of the family were rounded up by local constables and um, sent off to Gloucester Prison. So mm. it's it's fascinating you know so when when people you know think of coming to the clock tower don't just think that building walk around it mm. look up the history because how do we know that ghost spirits don't move around you know this yeah. all true yeah. um how do we know that someone who was murdered down the road don't come up and say oh what's going on here tonight then lads yeah. you know this is my argument with the other location that I'm passionate about you know it shouldn't be so haunted as it is supposedly so does that mean other ghosts come in and think oh I'll, I'll come and stay here for a little while yeah you know, my, my 1959 council house <laughs> I've seen three weird things over the, over the last sixty. Is years. that when you looked in the mirror, love? Oh, I try to avoid mirrors because <laughs> I have this illusion that I'm a size ten, and everything <laughs> stays where it's supposed to as I walk. Is there oh, any way you catch yourself in the mirrors when you walk past them? Oh gosh, no, no, we no. We wanted infrared light. Had to be a man because we all wear black. And then when you're reviewing video, your black becomes white and every bit of cellulite and your extra right ass cheek shows lovely on the camera. And I always bend over in front of my camera. Don't ask me why. Because I can't <laughs> to show off that extra ass cheek. Um, OK, uh, just just a couple of things. Richard, I've just double checked. Yes, um, the drug I'm talking about was called Mother's Little Help. It was also sometimes called Mother's Little Friend, depending on who was who was talking about it it could be where valium got its nickname from because we're talking early 1800s it was it was known as that um kelly's asked do we know where the term quaker came from oh that's I, and i've just had a quick google whilst you were talking see that's the benefit yeah. when i've got a guest like corinne who i can leave just talking for two or three minutes and i can google a fact <laughs> according to google it's something to do with the fact that people who were into that religion were ultra religious no. and no, it was something to do with them quaking in fear no Richard Felix you go on his history walk of Derby mm. this man was in front of the judge and because he didn't quake in front of the judge he was called a Quaker that's where it came from That's I that was actually one of the others I was going to yeah it, but they also said it was something about you quaking with fear at the thought of not going to heaven and they became yeah. known as so it's it's it, it, there's a bit of a sort of a it's something to do with it with um shaking not bowing down to the magistrate mm. fascinating so, like with a lot of things there's probably a few different beliefs as to where the term came from and it's, it's a bit like when you somebody gets a nickname and it's like where did you get it from well i don't really know i think it was because i pronounced my name wrong when i was little but i don't know <laughs> So yes, it's it's something to do about. It's either to do with quaking with fear at the thought of not getting into heaven, or or quaking with over excitement when when um, praying, or like Corinne just said, not bowing down to a magistrate. But um, I quite like the term. I quite like the term Quaker. I do. I do. Hmm. And you know, it just shows that how you know with with the emergence of you know the industrial revolution these new religions or slightly different christian religions were coming out you know the temperance movement mm. how that became popular mm -hmm. um you know it's it's wow you could talk for hours on it um yeah, anyway, you, you, could. Could. <laughs> you could well we're not really digressing that much because quakerism is to do with bristol and everything else so here we have this amazing place of work for the locals We've got, and then William, unfortunately, um, overstretches himself, as some businessmen have a tendency to do, and ends up going bankrupt in yeah. 1769 and has to sell it off. It seems to have a myriad of owners from then on. 
Um, and it takes us into the early 1800s when one of your favourite, I suppose I could say favourite, historical things happens in the area. <gasps> yes. Do you want to talk yes. about John Boy? Yes, and um, his affiliation with that famous gang. Mm. Over to you. The mic is yours. All right, thank you. Well, um, those that know Bristol, um, if you go down to what we call the feeder, you'll find a huge section of prison that's been left uh, it is the entrance to what Bristolians called the Old Goal, though at the time it was called the, the New Goal. And it was around about 1820, 1821. Well, there was a young lad called John Horwood who lived in Warmley and he had nine siblings. And like his father, most of the boys went down the pit because that's what they did. At about the age of 16, he decided to rebel. He wasn't religious. His family were Baptists, Me I think Methodists. And he started hanging around with a gang. Now, this gang was notorious around the area. It would be the equivalent of today's protection racket. They were called the Cock Road Gang. And the Cock Road Gang were absolutely naughty devils there were loads little, of them. little buggers yes yes and um i was just looking up some of it earlier to remind myself um so this is this is this is the type of caliber of this huge family eldest son george transported for life for housebreaking thomas and benjamin executed for burglary Thomas Joseph Samuel transported for burglary. A uh, grandson of the old, you know, the father figure, Benj uh, Benjamin, executed for murder. Grandsons transported. Other descendants transported, executed. <laughs> and even their daughter's husbands were transported or executed. Um, and it wasn't until around about 1813... They, they, they started to calm down a little bit, you know, and round about that time, 1821, when it was starting to go a little bit quieter, John Horwood was hanging around with them. So he was a 17-year-old lad, and his friend was called Elizabeth Balsam. And like most teenagers now, a bit naughty, stealing apples, you know, getting into mischief. Not as a sweet corn then. No, it's nothing like corn on the cob nicking. It's great fun. <laughs> and only one bag. Only one bag. So one night he saw Eliza walk across um, a local river with a friend, a male friend, and in the dark he just threw a stone. Now supposedly it hit her on the side of the head and then she fell backwards into the river went home and just had a few headaches so I'll try to make this I'll try to condense it down within two weeks she'd walked seven, five to seven miles to what we call Bristol the BRI so the local hospital because despite having bread poultices put on her head she was still getting headaches and she came to the attention of a surgeon who was working there called Mr. Smith or Dr. Smith. And he decided to keep her in against her protests. Now, one thing you have to remember is that when the Murder Act came in, I think it was 9, 1752, doctors were looking for cadavers. And on average with people being executed they're only getting about 35 a year yep. so where are they going to get cadavers from da 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 think of Burke and Hare I was about to say Burke and Hare I was sitting here with the gun but but I was waiting for a gap to go Burke and Hare now you, no. you stole that one from me <laughs> now I never knew how rampant it was in Bristol it was rampant oh. everywhere 
Yes. Anywhere but also, there was a medical training facility. Dr. Was... Smith got caught in a local graveyard about 15 minutes' drive from my house, but he managed to get away. Mm. And one time he was caught in his coach house, a body of a local woman mm -hmm. and her husband rescued the body. And because they, it was all friends in high places he just had a slap wrist off the magistrate the next day so i think he took a shine to this eliza he decided to do something called trepanning where they drill a, a round hole in the skull to relieve the pressure it got infected she died he blamed john horwood who then was coming up to 18 he was uh, imprisoned he was found guilty and just after his 18th birthday he was hung on top of this prison gates mm -hmm. 10,000 people came to watch it 1821 mm -hmm. he was the first one to be hung outside that prison uh, publicly and his family stood outside with a horse and cart to take his body but Dr Smith summoned a carriage and they bundled his remains into there and within hours he was on in front of about 80 people being uh what's the word taken apart dissected it's, dissected isn't his skeleton meant to be in um the bristol hospital training center or something still with a noose around its neck right well dr smith collected um body parts from people um, that he shouldn't have done he had a key to what they call the dead room mm -hmm. and people would collect the coffins after the undertakers had nailed it shut not knowing that sometimes the body wasn't in there and it was full of sandbags yep. so he had a museum of oddities so he had the skin of John Horwood bound into a book. The book can be seen in the museum called the M Shed, which is about 800 yards from where he was hung. So How basically this doctor was like the 18th century Zach Bagans. Yes. There's a lot more, but I don't want to, I, you know, I want to save that for other stuff that sure, I'm doing. Sure, sure. Well, interesting so, enough, after you and I talked about this case, I did actually look up on the newspaper archive site and I did find the, the, the reporting about John, um, although it yeah. said he was 23 and, a lot, and um, the young girl was 19 and that supposedly when the doctor opened her skull up, he found a huge abscess and that's what the infection and pain was and that's what killed her. So, you know, it's one of those um, That's false thing. reporting. A, yes, because the the book, I've got the contents of the book, mm. uh, and it has some amazing drawings of John on the mortuary slab. Mm. But so, unknown to Eliza's family, her skull, uh, the doctor took her skull, mm. and the skull is still around today mm -hmm. and then a lady called Mary um, Halliwell was researching her family tree and found out that she was a direct descendant of John mm -hmm. and petitioned to have his body buried so in 2011 mm. it's 170 years to the minute when 190 if it was 1821 he was executed 2011 yes 190 yeah, beg your pardon. He, he was his coffin was lowered into the grave the same time as he would have been hung. Yeah, and um, the undertakers who took it on free of charge, they even ordered um, a special black um, coffin. They looked yeah. into the rights of that time. They also used like a cart, didn't they? So it would have been. Uh, they um, got yeah, like well, a hand, hand cart type thing to to move yeah. the coffin, didn't they? Original hearse, and it it was you know I've seen the pictures. It's mm. it's amazing. But anyway, so in this smelting pot of this brass work site, you had all this going on. Yeah. It's yeah. you know when people say to me why why are you so excited about a place because 
it is exciting it's got murder mm. it's got treachery it's got gangs mm. you know this goes back centuries it's also got uh, war and fire yes now what you found earlier about that fire that was amazing you'd have to tell yeah. everyone that. i will i will because i'm quite proud of this i know everyone teases me that even when i get a special guest on who is an expert in somewhere and i, I mean we think we can agree that corinne is an expert i still wow. managed to find something to add to their little sort of shop of horrors shall we say and i did it again this time you will not be disappointed although it's not going to be a shock for me telling corinne now because we've already talked about it but she will verify she did not know this before i talked to her earlier yeah. anyway yeah. one of my favorite things to find out is obviously bristol as a place had um a very famous uh -huh. aircraft manufacturer there bristol air company who made things like the bowfighter the blenheim and so Fl Fil filton is that the right way to pronounce it filton was uh -huh. quite a target for the luftwaffe during world war Two because it was where a lot of these well it was where a lot of these aircrafts were manufactured but sites like uh, the warmly works would have been commandeered as 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 metalworks to make some of the parts that would have then been taken off to Filton to be put together for aircraft, which is what the case was. I think it was a firm called Magnol Products were actually in um, Warmly at that point, and they were a metal worker and they were making parts for the Bristol Air Company. Which for someone like me who's an aviation nut and a World War Two nut, I found quite an interesting fact. And the fact that the, the the factory itself or the site did get bombed a few times because it is in the direct line for Filton, and sometimes, you know, they they drop their bombs on a place they didn't mean to um, drop. <laughs> so I'm trying yeah. to be so yeah, they just decided to drop their bombs basically, thinking they got the right factory. So it was bombed a few times, and I think it was quite heavily bombed, um, but only ever incendiaries, never big old big berthers or whatever the german equivalent of big berthers were it was incendiary devices however however what i did find is on the 15th of july 1949 there's only one article on it there was a fire and it was at night and basically one of the, the i suppose the smelting pots would that be the right term for it had kind of got a bit overexcited and um bubbled out and was burnt, the floor was on fire. So the staff who were supervising did what they were told to do. They put this foam on it, apparently, to put the fire, flames out. But it had got so hot before they managed to put the flames out. Because this stuff is... I mean, when when you look at working conditions, and I know when I talked about um, old concept steel works last year up in uh, Durham, County Durham, and, and looking into what my great-grandfather's life was like working in a steelworks, it was a bloody dangerous place to be. Still is, to be quite honest, even with today's health and safety. But the heat from this this molten metal actually set the roof on fire. So in the fire brigade came out, and the problem they had was if any water got into any of the other pots, and that would have caused the, I suppose the magna, would it be the magna, magma, magna, whatever the term would be, to actually yeah. get a bit overexcited and set fire to something else so they had to be really really careful and it did pretty much destroy that section of the roof although not bad enough that they couldn't go back to work because i think the newspaper article says they were back at work later that day but oh, yeah. great british spirit great british spirit yeah nothing will stop us but it did burn the roof down now nobody got hurt from what i can make out from the article which is an amazing fact in itself um but it's not the only time that there's been a a fire there, is there? No, 1982. Yeah, where the roof caved uh, in again. Yeah, um, there was a death, but out of respect for well, family. Too modern. Yeah, we we won't. Yeah, we won't go into that one. But I've got an interesting little fact. This huge boating lake. Do you know when they decided to fill it in? For those that believe that buildings, you know, bricks called paranormal activity the the bristol blitz which was famous because bristol literally got annihilated central did, bristol yeah. yeah a lot of the rubble ended up in that lake as film oh i get what you're going at here yes so you know they're, they're on this boat in lake now there's what they call static caravans so like retirement mm -hmm. caravans yeah. Um, but it makes me wonder one day, and I must do it because you can go quite close, 
close to them without being intrusive and you can go sort of round by um, Neptune where Neptune stands in a field mm. so you can do that and I just wonder you know what would you pick up exactly you know what you've got to do you've got to take one of your dogs accidentally let them off the lead so they start running and you've got to go and get them <laughs> yeah three in the morning <laughs> Hey, I can't make it perfect straight away. <laughs> so what sort of things have you experienced there? Because we, we, do you know what? We're doing really good. 50 minutes in and we're still on sub- subject more or less. Hey, I, I, I think we deserve a round of applause for that. So what kind of things have you actually experienced there? It's like any place. It depends on what you think is paranormal. You know, over the years myself, I've become really sceptical. Yeah. But I have had a couple of interesting um, EVPs. One sounded like a child... Mm-hmm. Um, the other seemed to be tapping on the back of a chair. Uh, I remember there was a chap doing DIY about four or five years ago, and he was there one night, and he heard from the flat, he heard the door go and clear footsteps. Now, that's the first floor landing. Mm-hmm. And the downstairs landing, and a lot of people don't like the downstairs landing. All right. uh, the, there is um, a room that they call the goddess temple so there are ladies there that obviously meditate and have their, their pagan beliefs they very kindly let investigators in as long as they take their shoes off mm-hmm. and don't touch anything which I think is very very kind and is yeah. um, strictly adhered to yeah um, there I wouldn't say it's massively haunted but the top floor where that is what we call the weaver's room mm-hmm. um, some people seem to to get children you know if you put toys up that seems to work mm-hmm. um, but I like it because it's such a cheap venue to hire mm-hmm. and so you, as, an, as an investigator you're given the keys you're trusted with the building which is fantastic yeah. it's a brilliant research place <coughs> For me, it's excellent if you've got a team, you want to do experiments, you want to do training, and depending on the weather, you can go out behind and then hopefully by next year would have the grotto. Now, the grotto, I read years ago, and I can't find it, that that was supposed to have been haunted long before I even became interested in the paranormal world. Mm -hmm. And we walked through there one one day, and Colin... CJ's everyone calls him. Yeah. And it's so interesting because he did not like that place at all, which is not like Colin. I was going to say, does CJ like anything? <laughs> oh, he does. <laughs> you know, his pagan belief, he, he said there's something not right here. So mm. we're hoping in the next couple of months to do a private investigation and hopefully do a couple more to see if we, we can get anything but again everyone's different in their beliefs one person will say is all singing and dancing another say is nothing Kelly has just it said is. that you should write a book <coughs> oh my god oh, I don't know my domain <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's your thing you're, you're the expert <laughs> I wouldn't go that far I wouldn't go that far yeah. so, so what else have you got that you're working on at the moment that you can tell us about well um i'm working on a documentary uh behind the scenes with some friends who own a production studio it started off as a bit of a fun thing and it's it's mushroomed and you know we are getting so excited it we thought it'd just be a youtube one but they think it actually could could go a bit further and we, we've got these ideas to do one in each city so I'm learning behind the scenes production and it is a fascinating journey and to sit and watch someone professionally edit mm. film footage it is mind blowing for me who has no idea what they're doing yeah. my, my, my editing is like a five year old in comparison <laughs> Uh, well, everyone. But, I mean, we, as long as I, I always think that there's so many people that you can learn from, you're stupid oh, not to. Oh. Do you know what I mean? You you can't be the expert in everything, and 
there's so much you can learn from people that if you don't get if you don't get take that opportunity when you're given it you're stupid but also, I believe you know I'm very very lucky I, I will try and absorb as much as I can and with my age it might take a little while because you know I'm moving <laughs> half a century you know the weight is the same as the age it's like a tree <laughs> <laughs> I also believe in giving something back, which my my dad always did, you know, uh, with his radio-controlled models. And to see in the last four or five years these new teams that you become friendly with, to watch them grow and yeah. develop their own area. Because I think none of us should dictate what they should do. Just say, look, here's belief, here's science. You decide which path you want. We will help you any way we can. And... It, they're just lovely people and lovely friends and mm. it's never about putting anyone down yeah because you can never learn enough no i agree and i wish more teams would you know look into the history side just a little bit more mm. as well as you know the paranormal side as we you know we're, we're both passionate about history yeah our english historical heritage to me is unique because it's a mix mass of so many different nationalities going down the centuries. Saxons, Celts, it's, it's, it's fabulous. Mm. Our language is made up of so many different languages. Yep. Yep. I'll you know, move. I've got the Lord's Prayer in from Roman, Celtic, Cornish, Welsh, you know. <laughs> early English, middle English and to see the development of of how we say things like heaven mm. uh, it is, well I love it, I absolutely love it and I'm so thankful to have this paranormal world that we all inhabit and such amazing people out there you're it's, talking about me aren't you yeah <laughs> Everyone, there so there are far more cool people in this this world, the paranormal world, than there are assholes. Yeah, but it's unfortunately it's, it's the assholes that seem to get focused on. But there is some. Um, I mean, you know, we're talk, talking. I'm just looking in the chat room. Wes has just said, um, "Awesome show." Corinne was amazing. He's off to work, um, oh, and he's put, he's put how he loves you, and that you introduced him to paranormal investigating in Edinburgh. Oh. He's such a gentleman and so nice. You know, he's he's what I call Mr. Gentleman of the Paranormal. He is, yeah, he is a definite. He's a very caring, caring person. Um, Sarah Jane has just put, we're both brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. I was getting a bit worried. Everyone's saying how wonderful Corinne, Corinne, Corinne is. And I'm thinking, hang on, I'm the one that's holding, keeping this car on the road right now for this show. You oh, know, God. I'm the one that's stopping us going off on a tangent and talking for three hours. Um, <laughs> joking aside, I do enjoy talking to you, Corinne. You, you, you have got such a great way of approaching things. And, <laughs> and like you say, we've both got a very similar passion in the history and teaching people stuff and giving them a chance to learn something that they may not have already learned and I guess you can take it or leave it but um I I I I genuinely I'm I'm saying with you we were discussing it earlier I discussed it with Jane Harris last week I don't know how anyone can be into the paranormal and not be interested in the history as well because to me they they cross over they are and 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 I don't get it but I I think it's actually because a lot of people they equate history with being dull because they remember their history lessons at school and they're they're, I don't know about nowadays because I'm obviously not at school but I I mean I do remember my A-level history was dull as dishwater so I guess World War 1, World War 2 you know I wanted to know and you that's my thing I like unusual facts yeah Um, I've always remembered since I was about oh, 15 when someone said to me, did you know the word of majesty came in when Henry VIII left the Church of Rome? Because all the monarchs were called your highness, your grace. Mm-hmm. Afterwards, to make him exalterated on a higher plane, that's oh. when our sovereigns were called your majesty. Silly little things like that. I love it. Yeah, no, I, I'm... And yeah, I, I just like stuff. I just like 
it's it's real it's it's it really did yeah. happen and I, I don't get when people aren't aren't interested um so i'm the same as you so you got anything going on with the jamaica inn at the moment because that's your other sort of baby isn't it yes yeah um i don't know what's happened for some reason it that our public nights have just sold out we're on to january now um, what do you mean you don't I, know what's happened it's because they're good oh thank you you're so kind no it's just it's gone crazy um the dining with the dead is sold out that's something completely new and different if it works we'll do it again but we wanted a night where richard felix coming down because i could listen to him for hours he'll sit and tell you ghost stories and then we're going to have these projections going past windows past walls looking in at you with just candlelight around you while you eat a supper and then when that hasn't scared you enough then we're going to do an investigation so i'm interested to find out will that make it more paranormally active will it have an effect as an investigator i want to know if that makes a difference because then you could think oh experiment time be interesting um, won't it? i'll be interested in how that comes because i know some places now they'll watch a scary film before they do the investigation um to see if that wraps people's psych uh, yeah. up yes yeah guinea pigs um we did that once at a famous gothic place i can't say but we were watching the entity and we'd sent just two people off a time to investigate 20 minutes then they would come back and then another two and it's amazing how creeped out psychologically you feel yeah cool it's really cool. you know take the one up let's get kev Curran and tie him up naked <laughs> that's a different type of show let's be honest <laughs> well kelly has said it sounds amazing and she's going to book up one of those nights hazel has said um great show and thank you hazel for listening um sarah jane has said she actually enjoys really enjoys hearing about the history of locations before investigating so we've 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 got another one on the line now we've got another one we've uh, we've turned on to the love of the history side of things so well that's been our hour girl it's flown by it does doesn't Absolutely. it but again thank you because you know when you're with someone who's interested in history suddenly you start flowing and you remember things that you haven't thought about for years and you it is just fabulous to have someone like-minded and you know i'm the student you're the master so thank you for having me on your oh, show i'm I do not the master you wally no, I'd say, I'd say we're both pretty equal, girl. I'd say we're both pretty equal, but thank you for that anyway. Well, that has been Karimba San. That wasn't too bad, was it? I, I actually don't feel that battered or bruised for holding that one on the tracks. That was quite enjoyable. Um, she's laughing in the background. I've mu- muted her, so... Um yeah that that was uh, i hope you all learned something from there there is so much more we could have talked about the whole john hallward thing and the cockroach gang them alone trust me there's an awful lot on that that you could um you could listen to so so keep an eye out for corinne's um sort of documentary on it all because i'll be watching it whichever way format it comes out although i'm going to have a word with her she's coming to one of my cities she's got to call me first i think that's fair Mm. I'll have a word with her off air about that. <laughs> well, next week, next week, I'm going to be talking about the Victoria Tunnels up in Newcastle. Be an interesting one, area I've not talked about before. That's going to be quite, quite different for me to look up. Don't forget, tomorrow night is the PSH radio show. And then on Friday, you've got the Dark Mirror show. And on Saturday, Sunday, sorry, um, there's a special interview again for you. This time, it's with the wonderful, newly sort of planted herself in the uk from australia as well beth darlington of access paranormal kerry's going to be talking to to her so do tune into that one because beth always has a lot of very very interesting stuff to say but on that note if you've missed any of our shows head on over to spreaker or head on over to our youtube channel remember to click like share and subscribe and i hope to see you next week but before then have a good evening sleep tight and don't worry too much about things that go bump in the night Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.